Good morning or good afternoon or good night, wherever you uh, you are in our panel. We are, I think, um, all over the world. We're going to talk about what it takes nowadays, especially in India, for a CEO to break the ranks and to be come as famous as few of um, them, which we already know, like uh, Ratan Tata, Anand Mahindra or Lax Lakshmi Mittal. Of course, we all, at least we women, want to be Indra Noi uh, because she made it uh, to the top. And maybe some of you would like to be Sundar Pichai. I don't, I don't know. My name is uh, Annette Nijs. I'm a former cabinet minister for education, uh, culture and science. And um, we're going to talk about uh, what it takes to be a good, uh, good leader. I'm going to introduce um, the panelists uh, one for one, and uh, then they will tell us in a few minutes uh, what they think about this topic, and then we can uh, all uh, have a conversation. Um, Marianne, uh, Marianne Moro, you're the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of Ninth uh, Gear. Uh, can I give you the floor first? Absolutely. And thanks so much, Annette, for moderating. And thanks, Frank, for um, putting together yet another spectacular sarasis. Um, my, as you said, you heard from Annette, my name is Marianne Morrow. I'm the chairman, chief executive officer, as well as founder of Ninth Gear. And I'm a capital market specialist, and my background is institutional finance. Um, and I am based in the Bay Area of California, in San Mateo, in Silicon Valley. And so as I think about about this topic and, and what it takes to be a great leader. You know, there's so much art and science to it, but I think that there's a couple of really key things that I always think about in leading, and that is to be present and in the moment. Um, there's so many distractions in our world today, and um, you know, from chiming and clocks that we're hearing right in the background to um, our ever-present um, devices that are always beeping. And, and I find that you know these devices are great, but um, our ability to think and think clearly is just constantly interrupted. So I try to ensure that I'm present in the moment when I'm when I'm in meetings and talking with people. I'm also intensely curious and ask a lot of questions and I'm a voracious reader. Um, so those are some of the key tenets that I think about because I, I want to understand um, what the history has been on topics, but also that sometimes I've always thought that past behavior was indicative of future results. But in some of these new things that are happening in the world, that's not always true. In capital markets, it used to be that that stocks worked one way and bonds worked the other, and they were always in, inversely correlated. Well, those things are no longer. And, and I see so many of these types of patterns in the world that you know used to predict one thing, but um, now they often, um, as we move to global digitization, suggest something very different. So we have to be nimble and our ability to adapt and be resilient is so critical, especially with the, the years that the last 18 months that we've had, we need to be able to be very resilient and tenacious as we look as leaders. You, you chose a very timing because my clock is ringing again. <laughs> You're talking about these uh, soft uh, skills, and um, recently, uh, not so not that long ago, Harvard Business uh, Review uh, did some research on uh, what Indian leaders think is most important. And they said, uh, of course, to give some input uh, in business strategy. And Ganesh, I want you to um, uh, re reflect on that to um, make sure we have a good organizational culture that are one and two. Number three is to guide um, and to be a role model uh, for my people. And the last one uh, is to be the representative uh, of the owners and to um, make sure the shareholders are happy. Uh, and the last one uh, often in Western companies is uh, is the first priority. Um, 
And I was wondering, uh, Ganesh, uh, Ganesh uh, Rengaswamy, you're co-founder of uh, Quona in India. Um, how do you look at Indian leadership? Thanks, Annette. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor and for inviting me. Can Can you please uh, repeat the last sentence again? I'll, I'll yeah, the last question. priority is to be there for your shareholders. Right. And and what was your question? Can you repeat that, that again? Indian uh, business leaders often give the following four priorities, according to uh, to Harvard uh, Business School. Um, my main role is to give input in business strategy, then to make sure we have a good organizational culture. Then the third to be a guide and a role model for my mm -hmm. people. And the last one is to uh, take care of my shareholders. Uh, I think that's, that, that's uh, conceptually comprehensive enough. I, uh, you know, a couple of things if, um, that I would probably uh, throw into the mix while we reflect on those four is um, are that, you know, if you look at even last uh, 10, 15 years, there is a significant transformation cycle every three to five years. Um, you know, we just had uh, one of the largest uh, digital IPOs in the region happen two days ago in India in Zomato. Uh, I was on the board of a company called India Mart, which was the largest uh, digital IPO in India in the last decade. And, uh, you know, the stock has gone up 800 percent since they went public, etc. So nature of the, the landscape is also evolving very fast. I think uh, there was a times when we there was a time when we had uh, conglomerates as the market leaders. Uh, there's still some pretty significant conglomerates in the country, but you're also trying to see more specialized businesses uh, emerge. Uh, and the uh, other significant trend is you are certainly starting to see businesses with more digital and tech uh, uh, prevalence also emerge. And the nature of leadership and organizational culture also evolves along with that. Um, you know, the, the, the nature of leadership and, and organizational hierarchy was a lot more defined in a, in a traditional organization maybe 15, 20 years ago versus what we see in these new age organizations which drive more creativity, uh, you know, more innovation, more technology, digitization, so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's a more complex time in that sense for leaders, uh, not to mention the last 18 months, which, which certainly has made everyone's life um, you know, it's it's kept us all guessing a lot more in terms of what in terms of what the future holds. Um, so I, I I would say uh, the 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 context in which we evaluate those four parameters, uh, those four uh, pillars, has uh, evolved significantly, and I think that's the whole endeavor in terms of trying to understand what it means to actually set the organizational tone and culture. To uh, to be a role model for your uh, uh, for, for for your organization and employees when when we are all in lot more of a learning phase than we were you know in traditional organizations where usually people grew up through the ranks and had a pretty good sense of the business and they could also be seen as domain experts and leaders but that's not always the case today uh, we have we have to define an organizational culture which is less hierarchical. And uh, and promotes a lot more creativity and innovation while ensuring that it doesn't go haywire. Right, so it's that fine balance which is which is a lot more challenging today. And uh, the last point I would make, uh, uh, you know, just in, in in this opening statement is, I think whether it's in India or across markets, and we as Kona invest in 14 countries. Uh, you know, we are probably the largest financial inclusion, digital financial inclusion fund in emerging markets today between Asia, Africa, Latin, and Middle East. But uh, not just in India, I think across markets, I would say the definition um, and, and what it means to have high integrity is, is, is somewhat under threat because time and again, we see leadership uh, that would not necessarily stand the test of integrity uh, being rewarded, at least in short and medium term. And, and that's actually making a lot of folks reflect and think as to uh, 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 you know, how to conduct themselves and whether the, the principles with which we grow up and the, and, and the standards of moral and integrity we are, we are asked to uphold actually do um, um, uh, you know, uh, um, deliver the rewards that, uh, that one expects. And, and I think it's a pretty, it's a difficult question to answer and, and, and a very long discussion 
um, there are a lot of examples that have made people really reflect on that. Okay, thank you, um, Ganesh. And um, Andy, Andy Habermacher, you're the founder of uh, Leading Brains in, uh, in Switzerland. Um, what is your take on this? Yeah, so uh, the, the name Leading Brains comes from obviously from brains, um, and you know the, the field I'm I'm active in is applying cognitive neuroscience to leadership or to organizational development, thinking of organizations. So I'm always thinking of what does the brain do and how does this translate into into behaviors, uh, obviously that drive performance or, or drive success. So I, I, I always take it back. So, um, And I think that there's a, there's a number of very interesting things that, that we think of when, when we look at, at the brain. And we can look at the brain or psychology and we, we can translate it into different language along the way. Uh, but basically our brain is designed to, 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 to function in certain ways. Uh, and those certain ways uh, can obviously cause also certain problems. You know, there's huge biases. There's how we process information or incorrectly focus information. Uh, I mean, Marianne spoke about how we focus or we get, you know, unfocused on on, on too much noise and too many distractions. Um, so there's there's a bunch of very interesting things about that, which you know. Again, each of these could be the different conversations. When we think back to, to leadership then and, you know, getting to the ranks or, or being the next leader or being, you know, a C-suite leader or, or a board leader, I think there's a number of things that have become interesting. One of those certainly is the, this concept of distractions. Can you actually focus on the things that you need to focus on? Um, I think there's, there's something to do with really having a clear understanding of what a leader should be doing in different ways and translating that into a way that we can keep your focus. And one of the classic mistakes I see in, in most organizations, uh, and rather than thinking of hierarchies, I, we, we think of functions. You say, if you're a team leader, what do team leaders need to do? You know, which is engage teams, manage teams, get their energy, get them motivated. If you're the next level leader, what does the next level leader need to do? And what is the really clear function of that? You know, which you're going to start needing to think of more systems. You're going to start thinking more into processes. Start thinking and engage and developing pretty on, on, on broader levels. If you're an organizational leader, what does an organizational leader need to be doing? I'm really thinking very clearly about those levels and getting the right people, obviously, because you know the old, the old expression, "What get you know? What got me here won't get me there." You know, comes comes to hand. You know, it could be a brilliant technical person. Uh, but that's not going to make you a great organizational leader. Organizational leader, you're going to need a bunch of very different things, and we're often selecting people for the wrong reasons and promoting people for the wrong reasons. And this is a mistake I see in all organizations across the world, You know, whether, whether it's India, whether it's Africa, whether it's <laughs> the U.S., whether it's Europe. We've seen some classic mistakes. Uh, the next so thing... Are that, you saying, Andy, that all those CEOs that are classical mistakes, that they... Um, um, are now leading at the top? Uh, there's a surprising um, <laughs> amount of people who, who've got there through not always the right reasons, <laughs> you know, you know, which, which bunches of things, you know, the, the, the one class of thing. But it's something I also really put out there is obviously you have to manage the political man landscape as well. It's underestimated. You know, when you get to a very senior level, there's, there's a political landscape within the organization and without the organization that has to be managed uh, and is often forgotten. You know, you're looking at some technical skills, this strategy or, or, or culture, but you're having to manage a political landscape. And you're also having to put yourself out there and, you know, take you know, responses to, to, to COVID or different situations from different governments or different organizations, you know. Suddenly you have to put yourself out there. And are you going to take the lead, you know, and be a leader? Or are you going to sit in the background and wait for everyone else to make a decision and just, just follow the, the, the flock? So there's bunches of interesting things. I think the one thing I've I've also come to realize Can we it's, keep that thing for later uh, Andy because I want to move on and give uh, Sam the chance to make uh, his uh, statement um, Sam you're in uh, Africa uh, yet another culture in our uh, in our panel um, Sam Adeyemi you're a principal uh, consultant um, tell me uh, what do you think what does it take to really um, come to the top, 
but then in a deserved way, not by mistake. You're on mute, um, Sam. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> Thank, no you. <laughs> Thank you, Annette, and thank you, everyone on the panel. I am Sam Ademi. I am a global speaker and a leadership consultant. I help leaders to see possibilities and to become those possibilities. Now, I, I find this interesting, uh, what we're discussing right now, because especially of the rate at which India's economy is, is growing, because I think it's the fastest growing economy in the world right now. And I really appreciate uh, Ganesh's uh, insights, the insights he gives us into the dynamics going on right now, the landscape that is changing so fast. My first emphasis would be on culture. Now, not everything about culture, but the leadership culture, uh, because I'm aware of the globe research that was carried out many years ago that was led by Geert uh, Hosfeed, and they identified national cultures, you know, some five dimensions of national culture that influence the way leadership is done. The first one is the power distance. And Ganesh did mention the issue of hierarchy. Uh, the challenge with cultures that have high power distance, like you have in most developing economies, I mean, like in Africa, Asia, you know, South America, uh, the challenge is that in such cultures, um, the powerful are very powerful and the powerless are very powerless, okay? And naturally, a lot of leaders don't feel that the powerless or their followers are deserving, you know, of leadership or of the authority. Uh, so I'm a bit happy that um, Ganesh says that the structures are collapsing a little bit <laughs> or in transition. But CEOs need to be very conscious of that because the external culture, the culture in the external environment always seeks to influence the culture within an organization. So we're talking about um, CEOs being ingrown in an organization. But where you don't have the culture of empowerment, then we're looking to hire CEOs from outside. Now, we're getting through the pandemic. There's a global war for talents. Obviously, it's going to be pronounced in India as these huge opportunities, you know, show up. And uh, we're not going to have enough CEOs to hire from the outside. So CEOs need to combine leadership development with succession planning, which means they need to develop a pipeline of leaders within their organizations. So uh, back to the article by HBR, then you see some of those factors there. Uh, the modeling, you know, and then the leadership culture. So we need to pay attention. So even where the CEO is interested in empowering people, the possibility is that there are people down the line on the leadership hierarchy that are not keen on empowering people. So the CEO needs to pay attention to that. We have to be deliberate about recruiting people. We've got to, from the point young managers are being recruited, we need to have the CEO position in mind. And we need to design their leadership uh, development uh, program. And we need to pay attention to their uh, progress. We need to identify high potential leaders and give them the best opportunity to grow. I, I see uh, Ganesh uh, nodding. Um, uh, what do you um, uh, think when you hear this uh, from Sam uh, Ganesh? I think I was I was nodding because of two reasons. One is um, a point I made uh, earlier, and and Sam was referring to as well, which is the fast changing landscape and ecosystem where 
we have to uh, we have to develop more leaders lot more rapidly for sure um, um because of a I mean, lot of things how the land I, I think ganesh uh sorry can you are you able to hear me um, ganesh you were freezing a, a little yeah. um so for okay i hope it's better now um yeah so uh, the point i was making is because of all these reasons we are in a lot more dynamic environment where i absolutely agree that developing more leaders is is become essential um i think a slightly uh, uh, a counter or paradoxical point i would oh, oh now we are losing uh, ah <laughs> oops Yes, you you're back again, uh, Ganesh. <laughs> is it what is was that only me? Did I yeah, get you, you were you were left with your paradoxical point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I uh, I think the paradoxical point I was making is um um is is we are at a crossroads on how exactly to do that because the previous generation of leaders and 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 leadership co- you know um uh uh I think I keep going in and out I'm not sure why yeah that was just one or two seconds so please um continue okay. yeah i think before i before i lose you guys again i'll quickly make that point i think what i'm saying is um the way to develop leaders we we, we are going through a discovery cycle on what's the right way to also develop meaningful leaders and young younger leaders in 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 these times and i think that's where i would say even though we all understand the need i i i don't think i'm seeing enough on the ground ground on how how to be able to do that and again that long longer discussion on its own on how uh, how we can do that and what are the ideas but that was the counterpoint and from where you are sitting um, and the um, and knowing what you um, know about uh, the brain um what does it take for leaders to get their brain or their head around uh, this uh a number of things but uh, I, i think one of the things uh, we we've mentioned this already is obviously that the brain builds an operating model of the world essentially you know you, you build an operating model so you can operate in the world and this is where there's a bunch of clichés in you know what should i be doing as a leader you know and if you know the leader the, the the operating role model you know and this comes back to what sam said about you know also paradison is to be the boss uh then you know you you just start in these behaviors which are, are being the boss you know and that's just a model we have or we grown up with or has been come through the culture be that's you know national culture or organizational culture so there is really thinking about what is the operating model that we want to build you know if my model is you know my role as leader is to build more leaders as we mentioned creating the leadership pipeline then we're going to engage very differently with the world around us you know so then it's it's a one selecting the right people but then it's developing the right people and then getting the right operating model in in this thing here to start engaging with the world in 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 a different way uh, a more conducive way because if we're building leaders if i say my role as a leader is to build other leaders but that's going to translate into very different uh, behaviors but also very different cultural environments uh, th- that's going to make a lot of things a lot easier <laughs> and and how do you uh, relate to this uh, maria so i think a couple of things um especially andy with what you were talking about i also think that opportunities need to be provided to folks and also to help them develop that muscle because we're not born leaders right i mean i think that it's something that we develop over time and to be able to provide those opportunities in in sometimes controlled environments that i i like to do with teams i often ask when i finish calls if if you know i go around and make sure i i give everybody an opportunity to speak and i ask them direct questions like what do you think about this or how do you look at this from this angle just to make sure that i have diversity of thought but i do think it's a muscle that has to be trained and we need to be able to provide those opportunities and also to help 
um, individuals recognize some of these patterns. I always think about you know, if you, you never have 100% of the data that you need when you make a decision. If you have 40%, you may make the correct decision, but you might have, it might be too early. If you have 70%, you're probably waiting too long to make that decision. So how do we enable these leaders to um, ensure that they're looking for those patterns so that they can make the best decision at the time and so that when they look back, they, that they say yes and so they become more comfortable about that. So I try to provide these some guardrails for, for my team, but also try to instill with them that Failing is not always fatal, and we learn so much from when we try and and we don't succeed, but yet we do we do still try because we learn so much when we fail, and, and it's important to, to to provide those opportunities and and still um, be a cheerleader and champion, especially if things don't go as according to plan. And and what do we do to correct mistakes? And it's it's okay to fail, but uh, every now uh, and then a success, I think, is also quite um, uh, relevant for uh, breaking uh, it into uh, leadership, uh, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I wanted to invite uh, the participants, if you if you like, you can uh, grab the mic and ask a question, or if you want to put it um, in the um, chat, that's also uh, fine. I wanted to discuss with you um, the idea, we have an Indian focus uh, today. Um, is there something different what Indian leaders um, should or shouldn't um, learn? Or the other way around, should we uh, in other, uh, other regions learn from the Indian leaders? That's uh, obviously also possible. Do you have a view um, on that? And Ganesh, can I start uh, with you? Mm, sure, and it, um, yeah, that's a pretty uh, <laughs> deep question. Um, uh, I think we have a confluence of things going on in the, in the ecosystem now. You obviously have, you know, on, on one side you have um, the previous generation leaders who have grown up in a certain way and who are CEOs and you know uh, are, are, are in boards and um, um, uh, senior roles in traditional organizations, and um, there I think there is a mix of classical uh, you know uh, hierarchical uh, organizations and a mix of what folks have learned from 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 the um, early days of independence from classic large government and public sector institutions. And that's a very different dynamic. Right? Then you have uh, you, you you have organizations where uh, you, you on the other extreme you have the new age organizations which obviously operate very differently. And if you come to Bangalore, you will see that a lot of the classical tech uh, digital organizations are no different from what you see in the valley, right? And I, I in the last twenty years I've spent ten years in valley and ten years in Bangalore, and there's absolutely no difference in the folks that I you know in the circles that I move. And in between, then you have organizations which are trying to uh, transition and, uh, and and evolve. And from a talent perspective, you have folks who have grown up uh, through the system in India. Um, uh, and at the same time, you have enough folks nowadays who come who, who have more diverse background in terms of where they have been educated, where they started their careers, and then they eventually, you know, a number of folks have come back to India, especially in the senior leadership positions. So um, I think the answer the answer is not uh, straightforward. You're seeing a confluence of all this, and and if yeah, and depending on which sector uh, um, and 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 what your foundation and context is in 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 life, and what's the kind of function uh, you are working in, uh, you know, uh, you're operating under. I think you'll see you'll see a very diverse um, uh, uh, set of behaviors from from different kinds of leaders within with, within the ecosystem. It's interesting, Ganesh, that you answer this question this way, because to me this uh, already um, shows um, that you are an Indian person who puts wisdom in his or her answer. 
I think a lot of Western people would immediately say one, two, three, four, and uh, on on both uh, questions. So I, I think to me that is already um, uh, yeah a, a typical way of of uh, a difference uh, between how you would answer it and and someone else. Marianne, where you are, um, there are many. Indians, uh, I, I assume, eh? uh, we've seen uh, a lot of Indian uh, leaders uh, in all those high-tech uh, companies. Um, do you see a difference or do you think we can learn something or what sh or should they learn from us? Or Sure. Well, first off, uh, being in the heart of Silicon Valley, first off, as a um, someone that was born in New York, um, I very much feel like I'm a minority because we have so many different ethnicities here in the Valley. And, and so I, uh, Ganesha, it's a good that you're laughing at that because my closest supermarket is via cash and carry. And I have to say, every time I go in there, I love it. And I always learn something and I make a new friend because I'm, I'm so curious as to what's in the supermarket and how do I use this and that. And, and everybody that I meet in there always gives me their, their email and say, oh, if you need help or tips, you know, let me know. So I, I feel like being here in the Valley, it's, you know, it's so collaborative and, and I just love that. And um, I have a, um, several um, Indians on my staff. Um, and so it, it, I always just find the perspective is just so different than, than how I view things. So I'm always like curious as to how we approach different types of um, problem solving, which is great. I'm also um, at 5 a.m. every Tuesday morning, I'm on um, a networking group with um, the majority, like 85% Indian women that are just powerhouses in, in, their, in their area. It started by a woman named Joya Das who interviewed the, the person that rang the opening and closing bell at NASDAQ. And she's brought together this incredible cross section of uh, mostly women. And I have just learned so many great tips as to how they approach um, approach the world and problem solve. So I don't think it's different with regards to, you know, the training. I think it's just a, a deeper appreciation of different people's values and, and the ability to absorb wisdom from individuals. So, and it's also taught me a lot about empathy because that I think is a real key leadership skill and something that I always try to, to pause before responding and really just listen. And that's something that I've learned, um, especially from this diverse thought process, especially um, in the Indian community. And, uh, and the, I don't know if it is possible, but do you see a difference in the way brains work across cultures or how do you relate to this? <laughs> that, that's a really big question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the, the approach we've already taken, because I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, I mean, I mean Sam spoke about a whole seed at the start, you know, uh, and we've taken an approach is really simple, always focus on individual brains rather than broad generalizations. There's just too many broad generalizations and it, you, it leads you sometimes down, you know, dangerous paths. So we always say, try and guess, uh, you know, brains then we say there's a general model we built um but we say you know it just it changes by culture so for example the concept of self-esteem is present in all cultures each culture has a drive for self-esteem but how you build self-esteem is slightly different in different cultures and are linked to different symbols mm -hmm. so it's understand everyone has this underlying concept of self-esteem but culturally it can be very different. And of course, India is a, in itself is a massive country, as we said, you know, Bangalore could be very different <laughs> to, 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 to another place within India. Um, so we say understand individuals yeah. to drive individuals because you're going to have a team of people and you have to understand those individuals to get the best out of them. Also, I, I think it is interesting that you say that you touch dangerous grounds if you look at brains and different um, cultures. Um, can some uh, of you uh, close your mic because I hear myself uh, echoing that, that you find that difficult to, to do whereas if you look at uh, Hofstede um, or others they have no um, 
hesitation uh, to to sort of split uh, the world in in different uh, cultures so it's interesting that when it comes to the body uh, or the brain it's more and more difficult uh, to do that i'm going to you uh, uh, sam um and i wanted to hear uh, from you uh, if you have something to say what is typical between indian or uh, non uh, indian and there's also a question which i like to um, give to you from Suket Singhai. Um, he asks uh, an interesting, um, uh, he has an interesting observation. Now we are working more remotely. Uh, how do you identify tent? And uh, is there something which we can see or observe from how we uh, do things remotely, uh, which tells if we have certain talents or not? Sam, what do you think? Uh, thank you, Annette. Uh, uh, first, um, talking about differences in cultures, I would I would understand why Andy would not want to go into characterizing large groups of people because his specialization is with the brain. So I think of us so when I think of his specialization, I think of us humans being like hardware and software, right? So when it comes to the hardware, it looks like it's the same. <laughs> but then the software, which is the programming, the belief systems, I think that's where the differences show up. Um, so, yeah, uh, the culture in Asia, Africa, they're more common now. We, we're more close-knit. And we, uh, the social grouping, like family and things like that, it's, it's, we're not individualistic. We're more collective, I would say. It has its pros and cons when it comes to leadership, of course. So the way we socialize is a bit different, you know, um, not necessarily better, but different. And we have to learn to work around that because it has its pros and cons. Uh, talking about remote work and spotting people with potential. Uh, that's a different terrain right now for leaders. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I've, I've been talking to leaders who practically lived in the air, you know, be, uh, pre-COVID. They were, they were on a jet <laughs> every other day, and now they've had to sit at home for over a year, and they're running all their meetings online. And I've been asking, so how, how do you do it? In fact, one of them just started in a new role when the pandemic hit. So he said, you know what I do? He, he said, look, I, I get to know people by interacting with them, you know, asking them questions. Now I can't meet them. And I just started a new role. How do I know my team members? So he says, after all the formal work, then they switch to the informal. So it's like they have downtime online where they relate, they play games, you know, they, because that's where you get to know uh, people's character. You get to know uh, where they're different, what's different about them and so on. So that's what I would recommend to leaders that yes, on the job, uh, the way you meet and so on, you get to know them. Um, Coaching and mentoring is important. Mary Ann spoke about uh, providing opportunities for young team members, young leaders. Uh, and when she described how she does it, I, I saw what she's doing is mentoring and she's coaching. In a sense, we actually have to attend to each person, get to know their personality, get to know their team personality. Uh, what's the unique thing they bring to the team? Where are they at in their journey? in their career and in life, and then help them along collectively and individually. Thank you, uh, Sam. Um, we have some time to, um, to reflect, and um, I have one question for you uh, all. Um, say I'm um, this middle manager and I want to be promoted, um, not by mistake, uh, Andy, but uh, on my uh, real uh, efforts and what I've achieved um, to, the, to the leadership. 
Um, what is it that I should uh, bear in mind uh, in the next year or maybe in the next half a year? Uh, what should I do to break through? Who wants to start? I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in here. When I look at hiring folks, I specifically look to hire happy are people that get shit done. And I cannot overestimate how important happiness is in the journey because nobody wants to work with want was everybody has things that happen to them and we want to support people and listen, but sometimes we just need to leave some of the external things and just focus on being cheerful and having that cheerful disposition using you know the signals around us researching and just being really smart about what's happening right now and being able to to actually appreciatively show like progress on things and so i always reward effort amongst you know no matter what because it, it just shows that tenacity but the ability to be able to be just happy in your in your job is is just such a critical item for us and especially when we're doing things remotely in teams um it's it, it the collaboration and and just that teamwork just has to be there and people want to be working with people that they like and so that just adds this richness to this fabric so i really endorse like this the culture so much and make sure that as we go through that everybody fits in and works collectively and i i often put somebody with um a, a strength and a weakness together so that you can have this yin yang type of relationship and that we depend on each other as we as we go in because for us, we, we're working on a really big, audacious goal, and we will win or lose as a team. So that, that teamwork, it just has to be so integral. And especially, we've been remote since day one. So you know, pre-pandemic, we were all working remotely, and we figured out how to do that and do that well through a, a couple of key offsites where we're together. But oftentimes, it's individually, and it's, it's important to be remote but still you know know exactly when you should call on somebody and 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 ask them to help you out thank you we have a few minutes left so i wanted to ask uh, you ganesh andy and sam to uh, take one minute um ganesh who would you um, pick so that we know what i should do to um, break the ceiling um, I'll probably just uh, take what Marianne said a step forward, uh, which is, I think attitude is everything. And, uh, you know, what happens to people uh, is, you know, is what it is, but how you react to it is up to you. So I've seen, you know, same situation, two different people, one saying, okay, uh, you know, uh, how do I be creative and solve and try to figure this out? And if I do, I clearly stand out compared to peers versus there are folks who will right away say, why is this happening to me? I think most of the world lives in why is this happening to me mode. So it's really attitude and uh, and and yeah, I think with every job comes, um, like when I started my company, first company 15 years, 16 years ago, I used to tell all investors that I'm the janitor to CEO in the company. Like you just got to get stuff done. You don't have the luxury to say, oh, this is this person's job. When they come and they, they, they clean the office, then we'll start the work. So I think you just need to be a lot more flexible and open and 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 try to solve, try to find solutions in today's world. Um, I think lo unfortunately a lot of us realize that in theory, but we don't see that enough in practice. Thank you. Um, how about you, uh, Andy? Some advice? Uh, try to keep short. Uh, I think courage and direction. Um, so you know you really know need to know where you're going and that's the broadest you know to not, not not to diverge you know i'd say you have to be flexible but the, the, there's a big direction you want to be going in the, the, there's a big goal and you have to have courage uh, and you have to be brave and sometimes you have to make a really strong stand for that what you believe in and what you want to be known for and you have to go for it huh? go for it huh? yeah. this is what i hear from you and sam um do you Thank have some you. advice? Thank you, Annette. Um, I'll refer to something Andy said earlier on about being very good 
uh, on your job technically, and maybe because of that you're promoted and then you find yourself in the executive grade, it's a different set of skills now that you need to be successful. So I will advise the mid-level manager, you need to switch, you need to move from being just an operational leader to being a strategic leader, that's it. Think beyond your own department, think even beyond your organization. Check the environment, the changes going on, spot the opportunities for growth. Thank you. Um, and that brings us uh, to an end. And uh, for me, you rest me to say uh, thank you for uh, a lively and lovely uh, discussion. I think uh, we all learned uh, a few more uh, new things. Uh, Sam Adiemi, Andy Habermacher, Marianne Moro, and Ganesh Rengaswamy. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Anand. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.